it. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to WG University, Weber Gallagher's series of educational programs. This is our insurance group webinar series. I'm uh, Tim Stalker, and I'm presenting with uh, Kenneth Portner today from our Philadelphia office. Today, we're presenting on a, a current topic in insurance legal issues. If you would like to uh, view this webinar again or share it with others or see other uh, WG University programs, please visit the Weber Gallagher website at www.wglaw.com. And you'll find uh, copies of this presentation and others under the uh, WG University page. Also, feel free to contact the firm with any questions at questions at wglaw.com. Today's presentation is uh, Reinsurance 101. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, let's get started. It's our required disclaimer. I'm not going to read it to you. So today's agenda is what is reinsurance? We're going to go over some basic reinsurance terminology, some basic types of reinsurance. There are many types out there. The historical uh, reinsurance relationship, basic reinsurance provisions, particularly in a reinsurance treaty. I'm going to talk a little bit about arbitrations. Uh, and then uh, certainly if you have any questions, again, please feel free to contact us at questions at uh, wglaw.com. So what is reinsurance? Uh, reinsurance, and here's the uh, formal definition, is an agreement whereby a company agrees to indemnify an insurance company against all or a portion of the loss that the insurance company sustains under a reinsurance policy or book of business issued by the insurance company. In uh, abbreviated uh, terminology, reinsurance is insurance of insurance companies. Uh, examples of uh, professional reinsurers, Munich Re, Swiss Re, uh, Maiden Re, uh, Gen, Gen Re or General Re, Everest Re. Uh, and then you also have insurance companies, and I'm just picking out a few like Liberty Mutual or Chubb, who not only function as insurance companies, but at times as a reinsurers. So uh, we've, we've talked about what it is. It might help to uh, define it in your mind or, or make it clear in your mind to talk about what it is not. So, I mean, the hallmark of the reinsurance is that it's a relationship between an insurance company and in effect another insurance company but the reinsurer does not have any direct relationship with the insured, the, the party that is, is having either the claims asserted against it in a liability context or a, a party that is asserting a claim under a policy in a first party context. So some examples of things that, that you know, people may think are reinsurance but are not in fact reinsurance are an umbrella policy, uh, an excess policy. Those are two forms of insurance that are not primary insurance usually and that backstop a, another primary policy or sometimes a self-insured retention but but that's not reinsurance because the excess and the umbrella carriers have the relationship with the insured not with another insurance company surplus lines insurance i mean that's that's a uh, surplus lines insurance of course is insurance that is not admitted uh, in a particular jurisdiction uh, and therefore is subject to uh, somewhat less regulation uh, and uh, can write risks that are, are not a, uh, typically accepted by admitted insurers. But again, it's not a, a reinsurance. That's a direct insurance relationship with an insurer. Coinsurance. Uh, this would be a situation where you, you might have several overlapping policies. Um, it might be a situation where you have different types of coverages applying to the same loss, but again, it, it's it's not reinsurance because that relationship is between the insurance company and um, the uh, uh, insured, not between two insurance companies. Uh, Self-insurance, uh, a similar concept, and then there are risk pools, which again, are, are similar in concept, but again, aren't reinsurance because of the, the nature of the relationship. 
Now, um, sometimes there are um, reasons that, that a, a entity might want to have coinsurance instead of reinsurance. Um, it, it can produce the same effect, um, but uh, for various reasons, uh, companies might choose to, to get a coinsurance situation with multiple policies instead of reinsuring it. So anyway, that, that's the basic uh, rundown of, of comparison, if you will. Um, so let's talk about some of the terms that are, are, are used in the reinsurance relationship. So uh, obviously reinsure, this is the company, Gen Re, Munich Re, or uh, you know, a domestic insurer that's serving as a reinsurer that has the relationship with the, the insurance company. And the insurance company in this relationship, sometimes referred to as reinsured, seedant, seedant, or seeding company, and again, this is the, the company that it, in effect is ceding part of the risk to the reinsurance company. And uh, typically in the reinsurance uh, field, the reinsurer does not accept the entire risk. Uh, instead, it accepts a portion of that risk uh, and the amount that is, is not accepted but is instead uh, kept by the sedent is called the retention. Um, now, there is a, another form of reinsurance. It's reinsurance of reinsurance, and the, the, that insurer would be referred to as a retrocessionaire. Um, and again, the principle is, is just one removed from the seed and reinsurer uh, relationship. This is now a relationship between a reinsurer and, and yet another insurer. And then there's something called a fronting arrangement. And what that is, uh, it, it involves is typically a situation where an insurance company wants to uh, write coverage, for example, in a jurisdiction where it's not authorized to do so, uh, or um, wants to get into a, a business and take advantage of another entity's customers. I don't mean, literally mean take advantage, but rather leverage another uh, insurer's customers. And so what happens in that situation is the reinsurer assumes 100% of the program including the licensing issues and, and pays a fee to the insurance company, the sedent whose paper the reinsurer is using. And that's somewhat different from the normal relationship, which as I mentioned a moment ago, involves uh, not a complete seeding uh, of the risk to the reinsurer. So um, we've identified the, the, the general terms of the, of the uh, players. What are the different types of reinsurance? Uh, facultative, that involves a reinsurance of a specific risk. Um, and so as an example, Yankee Stadium, when that was built, uh, given the amount involved, um, there were specific reinsurers who accepted uh, the construction risk uh, uh, and you know, builder's risk for that, that project. And that was only with respect to uh, losses or claims that would be asserted under the seeding policies. There's also a, a type of reinsurance called treaty reinsurance. And this is uh, a, a broader arrangement where instead of specific risks being identified, the reinsurer will agree to accept uh, an entire class of risks. So a workers' compensation insurer may have insurance for all of the workers' compensation loss and risk uh, it could be in a particular state, it could be nationwide. There, there's a lot of uh, leeway that, that the, these entities have in negotiating these arrangements. Property, casualty. So again, as distinguished from facultative, that's something that's an entire book of business. And then uh, another category is catastrophe reinsurance. So this would apply to certain defined catastrophes. Of course, you, you can't anticipate the catastrophes, but um, that would uh, serve as a backstop to the, the really serious uh, uh, and severe risks that could uh, bankrupt an insurance company. Uh, so those are the, the three types of, of reinsurance that are typically seen. Right. Um, and to follow up uh, with uh, Ken's uh, note on uh, cat reinsurance or catastrophe reinsurance, um, losses for the insurance and reinsurance industry from natural catastrophes such as Irma, Harvey, uh, Maria, and some other um, uh, some other uh, natural events, 
was $330 billion in 2017. So one of the main purposes of reinsurance is to spread the risk so that the sedent or the insurance company doesn't bear the entire risk for these catastrophic uh, events. A uh, man-made disaster, just as point of reference, is, is something like the uh, reactor uh, uh, meltdown that occurred in Japan a couple years ago. That is man-made versus a natural catastrophe, such as a hurricane or tornado. <clears throat> Some types of uh, reinsurance, uh, proportional reinsurance, which could be quota share or surplus lines. What quota share means is that the reinsurers generally follow from dollar one and take a proportionate amount of risk uh, on uh, policies that the decedent or insurer writes. On surplus lines, um, again, the reinsurers would, would take a proportionate amount of risk, but it would be over a retention. Many times that retention for smaller, very small carriers, it could be $100,000. Uh, for larger carriers, it could be a million, or in the um, in case of uh, some carriers, at five or $10 million. Excess of loss is reinsurance coverage in excess of uh, a retention. Again, it can be any amount, but generally it's a million, five million, 10 million. But if you're dealing with smaller mutuals, it, it could be uh, much less. Stop, stop loss protection is uh, protection that is provided at a defined hallmark event. Uh, quite often, stop loss protection is provided uh, based upon loss ratio, meaning how the company is um, uh, doing financially. Um, an example would be if a book of business, let's say your workers' comp book, or even your property business, hit a loss ratio of 115%, then the stop loss treaty would kick in to provide protection for the sedent. And then financial or finite reinsurance. And this is um, reinsurance that transfers only a limited amount of risk. And it was really questioned a lot um, in the um, late 90s and, and, and early uh, 2000 regarding whether um, there was true risk transfer, which is required uh, both for reinsurers and insurers. But again, it's a, a minute uh, amount of risk that is transferred from the sedent to the reinsurers. Okay, so here's a uh, typical reinsurance program. I'll let okay. Ken run. So, so the example would be, uh, and this would apply either to treaty or facultative. Um, so you, you would have an initial layer, four million per occurrence uh, in the aggregate, excess of a million per occurrence, then a $5 million per occurrence slash aggregate excess of 5 million per occurrence and a 10 million per occurrence uh, slash aggregate excess of 10 million per occurrence. Um, and there can be multiple reinsurers. Remember, we were talking about the, the quota share portion, so you might actually have more than one uh, insurer uh, taking a piece of the, the, the sedent's risk, and uh, those would be uh, handled under separate, uh, separate contracts. Um, and while mentioning contracts, I, I guess we should also mention uh, that you know, th these contracts are, are uh, not uh, really comparable to the typical insurance policy that you're, you may be experienced with that are, are typically much more heavily regulated and have to be you know, filed with state authorities. Um, you know, reinsurance is a much different animal, and, and I think Tim will, will touch on that later. Right. Uh, to, to follow up uh, with uh, what Ken just noted, I mean, a, a reinsurance uh, treaty could be 30 pages, 40 pages long. A facultative slip could be just uh, a page or two. So, um, uh, again, uh, very different than an insurance policy. Okay, the historical relationship. <clears throat> Way back when, um, Re, the, the reinsurance uh, relationship was done uh, by a handshake. 
um, if, if you um, look back historically, <clears throat> it, um, it occurred um, over 300 years ago in Lloyd's in a, uh, a coffee shop or two uh, where um, insurers would get together and over a handshake agree to uh, share the risk regarding uh, some of the ships that uh, were sailing uh, in the British uh, Empire. It was considered an honorable undertaking uh, historically. At one point, um, <clears throat> the uh, relationship and the agreement were written on uh, napkins at the uh, coffee shop or a piece of paper. Both sides agreed to utmost good faith in carrying out their agreement and um, reinsurers agreed to follow the underwriting fortunes uh, of the sedent and follow the uh, claim settlements of the sedent. That, that was the historic relationship. It's become much more uh, contract related, much more complicated in the, in the past 320 plus years. <clears throat> so utmost good faith. It's, it's one that these, um, these couple of cases, by the way, are kind of preeminent in, in the field on utmost good faith. There's still good law. Uh, many of the subsequent uh, cases that are out there uh, cite these cases as precedent. And by the way, um, compared to insurance law, there's not that much reinsurance law out there. Why is that? Because most reinsurance um, disputes are handled through arbitration, uh, which is provided generally in uh, the facultative certificate and also in the uh, re uh, reinsurance agreement, the treaty agreement. So by and large, disputes are, are handled by arbitration uh, versus litigation. So the, as, as we said, the reinsurance relationship between the seating company and the uh, reinsurers was described as uberami. I can't even pronounce uh, Latin at this point, uh, but it, it's utmost good faith. And for those who know Latin, uh, they know it, it translates into utmost good faith. And at one point, it was unclear whether this duty of utmost good faith was one way, in other words, uh, to, between the sedent to the reinsurer or is reciprocal. And uh, the, the subsequent case um, involving New England Re and also the mentor insurance uh, versus Bron Casa uh, confirmed that the duty of utmost good faith between the parties to a reinsurance agreement is reciprocal. Doesn't matter if it's facultative or treaty or, or catastrophe. It's, it's reciprocal between the parties. However, <clears throat> the effort to uh, extend the uh, duty between a sedent and reinsurer uh, to that of a fiduciary relationship has had uh, mixed uh, support. Um, there is some support uh, in, uh, the, uh, in Illinois with the concept that it is a fiduciary relationship between the seeding company and the reinsurer. However, the majority of the courts uh, have declined to find a fiduciary relationship between uh, seeding company and reinsurer. So again, utmost good faith in most jurisdictions it's not a fiduciary relationship. And as you all know, if it was a fiduciary relationship, that would call into effect uh, other uh, duties and uh, responsibilities. Okay, we're going to go over some basic uh, provisions in a reinsurance treaty. Um, basically, uh, a reinsurance treaty Reinsurance agreement will have the term of the agreement, the coverage provided, and territory. Generally, in the in the United States, the territory is uh, the U.S. However, there are some reinsurance agreements that are multinational in nature. You need to uh, check that. 
Many reinsurance agreements have warranties that the sedent uh, makes to, uh, to the reinsurer. There's naturally a provision for premium, how premium is paid, whether premium can be offset by loss. Uh, there's an ultimate net loss provision, which means uh, how the reinsurers pay in excess of the retention. Uh, policy uh, defines what a loss occurrence is. Again, reinsurance agreements uh, will have the term loss occurrence. It differs, and we'll see it shortly, than the term occurrence, which is in most insurance policies. As a claims handling provision, an arbitration provision, <clears throat> like policies, there's exclusions in uh, reinsurance agreements, a definitional section, and an access to records uh, section, uh, which is important to reinsurers. So in going over just, um, for example, what a loss occurrence is, and I, I pulled this out of uh, one of the uh, reinsurance treaty. It's any accident or occurrence or series of accidents or occurrences arising out of one event. And uh, for example, in this particular treaty, it says as respects products bodily injury, injuries to all persons and all damage to property of others occurring during a policy period and proceeding from or traceable to the same causative agency shall be deemed to arise out of one loss occurrence. And the date of that loss occurrence shall be deemed the commencement of the policy period. So what, what that means is that for this particular treaty, you can accumulate with respect to products, bodily injury, and all damage to property, you can accumulate that um, if it comes out of the same causative event as, as one loss occurrence. So, for example, let's say you have multiple uh, bodily injury claims which are less than, uh, each one is less than a million dollar retention, but if you can accumulate them as one a loss as one loss occurrence, then it 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 can pierce the million dollar retention and be recoverable from the treaty. It's a little bit different than what uh, an insurance policy how an insurance policy operates. The uh, reinsurance agreements have a claim handling provision. Generally, they give uh, the reinsurer the right to associate, if it so chooses, in the handling of claim. There are some reinsurance agreements, particularly if um, it's a fronting arrangement, that would give the reinsurer the right to control. For the most part, overwhelmingly, the reinsurance uh, agreements give reinsurers the right to associate. Uh, Overwhelmingly, reinsurers uh, do not associate in the handling of, of the claim, although they have that right. Uh, the claim handling provisions also provide generally um, coverage for extra contractual obligations, such as bad faith or um, claims that uh, are verdicts in excess of policy limits. So, um since the reinsurer, of course, is, is several steps removed from the loss itself, uh, uh, there are notice requirements uh, in the, in the uh, reinsurance contracts uh, that require the sedent to, again, provide notice. And this is, this is not that much different from what you may be familiar with, with a, 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 an excess insurance policy. Um, and it, it's not surprising that the severe claims are the ones that are typically required to be reported, death, dismemberment, paralysis, major injuries, burn cases, uh, bad faith or excess bad faith uh, uh, claims and reserves uh, once they've reached a certain level of reserves incurred as a percentage of the retention. Uh, again, th this is, you probably have experience with this uh, in terms of dealing with excess insurers. Claim handling. I um, wanted to outline a few areas of, of concern uh, that arise between 
antecedents and reinsurers. And it's um, failure of, of the sedents to uh, report a claim timely or how uh, the uh, sedent in, in particularly in a, uh, let's say an environmental matter, asbestos, a progressive injury matter, allocates the loss or, or defines the number of occurrences. Inconsistency in presentations of the same claim type uh, uh, over the years. Uh, failure, failure to report uh, bad faith cases or punitive damages. Uh, ex gratia payments. Um, if uh, the sedent is going to make an ex gratia payment, it may not be covered under your reinsurance agreement, and it may be a good idea to attempt to get a sign off uh, before you make an ex gratia payment. And the other uh, issue are inadequate reserves. Uh, a very, an area of concern uh, for reinsurers. As a result, uh, they have the right to, uh, reinsurers have a right to inspect and, and audit the books of the sedent. It's an important right uh, for reinsurers, particularly um, um, if, um, if there's concern over reserve adequacy. Uh, in the reinsurance uh, agreement, the reinsurance treaty, it's it's um, it's the right to inspect, audit uh, the sedent. One of our favorite and well-used uh, provisions is the arbitration provision. Um, generally, um, the arbitration provision provides. Um, that uh, either party, the reinsurer or the sedent, if there's a dispute, can demand arbitration. Uh, each side uh, selects an arbitrator, and generally the requirements are that they have to be active or retired, disinterested executive officers of insurance or reinsurance companies in the United States or uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, or Lloyd, Lloyd's of London's underwriters. So what, usually the selection process involves uh, the two arbitrators being selected, and then they try to sl select a third within a limited time period. And if the parties can't agree, uh, it's decided by a coin flip, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, average even or odd, um, and, uh, or other uh, mechanisms uh, agreed by the party. It's a little bit disconcerting, that a uh, let's say a, a reinsurance arbitration that could be worth 10 20 30 million you're deciding the umpire on a coin flip or the dow jones industrial average um and the 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 panel the two arbitrators and the uh, umpire are guided by the language of the arbitration provision which generally says that it's the the reinsurance arbitration and the uh, agreement are an honorable engagement. In other words, uh, the arbitration will go forward as an honorable in engagement, meaning that the arbitrators and the panel are not confined to the strict rules of law. They look to the uh, business side. As I said, generally the panel's seasoned uh, in industry professionals a lot of times they are ARIAS certified uh, arbitrators. Um, they also uh, not only ex uh, uh, understand the legal issues, but also the business side. You don't have to be a lawyer uh, or have a legal background to, uh, to sit uh, on an arbitration panel for reinsurance issues. You can be an underwriter, a claim person, an actuary. And this is an interesting point, I think, because if, if you conceive of arbitrators as substitutes for judges, you'll be you know, familiar with certain rules that are applicable to contract litigation, for example, parole evidence or um, uh, the other sort of technical uh, rules that apply to interpretation of contracts. But the arbitrators in this context, uh, not that they necessarily would hear parole evidence, but because they have an extensive business background, they're bringing that um, that knowledge and they're applying it to the contracts, and you know will perhaps form 
ideas about what things mean or what they reasonably would mean based on the context of their knowledge. So um, that isn't always the case in, in other types of arbitrations where even though the arbitrator may be experienced from a legal standpoint uh, in, in litigation of that type, they're not necessarily someone who is in the business. Um, so I, I think that puts an interesting gloss on it in terms of the arguments you're making uh, at the arbitration. Right. Um, again, um, there, although there is some law uh, in the, on the reinsurance context, um, a lot of it is handled by these business professionals in, in an arbitration context. They know what custom and practice is in the industry, uh, and they'll look at custom and practice. They'll look at the business aspect as well as a look at uh, the legal issues. So uh, for a seasoned panel, um, it's, it's somewhat difficult to pull the wool over their, their eyes and, and merely argue uh, legal uh, precedent. Um, one, uh, one other note is that um, once you impanel the three-person panel, uh, each of the arbitrators and the umpire have a duty to disclose their relationships not only with the parties involved, but with other with the other panel members and also the law firms involved. You will find that there are some instances where the same law firm has appointed the same person uh, time and time again, or or the same party at the arbitration. That has to be disclosed so that um, that you get a panel that is uh, that is basically overall neutral. I mean, but you do have two party appointments, which can help advocate on their party's behalf. But overall, you want a fair, uh, a fair uh, panel to, to hear the issues. As a result, arbitrations tend to be wide open and expensive when compared to litigation. Um, you're paying the full freight for uh, your party appointment. You're paying half of the um, umpire's um, hourly rate. And those rates can be $400, $500 an hour. You're also paying, uh, should you go to hearing, uh, generally more times than not, they're in New York. So you're paying for their hotel bills, meals, and, and the like. And there is a tendency uh, to arbitrate the same issues over and over again, particularly with respect to environmental asbestos and other progressive injury type cases. They're still, they've been arbitrating these uh, these matters for 25 years. Uh, they're still arbitrating them. And that's a side effect of the arbitration because the, since there are no or limited legal precedent, you know, the, the issue doesn't get resolved under a certain jurisdiction in a, in a fashion that's going to preclude making that same argument again. So, Correct. So the current state of um, the relationship is – Generally, reinsurers will follow the fortunes, again, the underwriting fortunes, follow the claim settlements of the seating company, absent a showing of fraud, collusion, bad faith, or an ex gratia payment. Um, I, I cited uh, Travelers. Again, Travelers is, uh, is still good law. Uh, here, um, a, um, it, it involved a, an environmental uh, loss. Travelers was the seed in Girl and Global to reinsure. And during the course of negotiations between Travelers and, and the policyholder, um, Travelers uh, settled but abandoned one of their arguments that they made uh, to the policyholder. And Girling uh, uh, Global uh, um, rejected the, the, the billing that it received from Travelers, uh, alleging that it was being billed. On, on, the ba on a basis that uh, travelers uh, had abandoned that particular uh, methodology in its negotiations with the, uh, with the policyholder. And the court ruled that um, the reinsurer, in this case Gerling, is obligated to follow the sedent's post-settlement allocations, regardless of whether the allocation reflects a position initially taken by the sedent and abandoned as long as that billing was in good faith. So here, a girling was 
required to follow the settlements of um, of travelers and and, re- and indemnify them for the environmental loss. And contrast that to um, all state v. Uh, American Home uh, matter, in which the sedent's position was uh, so inconsistent with respect to the number of occurrences and how it billed the reinsurer that the court ruled that it was not acting in good faith in its post settlement allocation a, a, a loss uh, with its reinsurer and ruled that. Uh, the reinsured did not have to follow the settlements uh, uh, of uh, of the sedent in that particular action. And one thing I want to point out is that uh, when you read uh, these decisions, um, the courts tend to blur, follow the settlements and follow the fortunes uh, um, together. Uh, so sometimes, uh, again, they'll talk about follow the settlements and follow the fortunes regarding a claim uh, billing to a reinsurer. Can you explain the difference? Yeah, again, uh, follow the uh, follow the fortunes is following the underwriting fortunes uh, of the sedent. What the what the sedent uh, underwrote as a reinsurer, you should you should follow th- that that fortune. So the reinsurer can't say, well, you, that was a you shouldn't have written that risk, and and therefore I'm not going to participate. Technically correct. Sometimes, sometimes there are outliers that the sedent should should have brought to the reinsurer. Follow the settlements, of course, is following the claim settlements of the uh, of the sedents once the case is done. So, for follow the fortune, I mean, there could be a dispute between the reinsurer and the insurer over whether the reinsurer actually accepted that type of risk within it within its treaty. Correct. Correct. Overwhelming, though, the uh, reinsurance disputes are on um, on settlements, claim settlements. Saying, in, a, in essence, that you shouldn't have settled that. Shouldn't have settled it, or you're you're billing me differently than you how you analyze the case, or you're trying to uh, maximize uh, reinsurance, which is not reflected in your uh, your loss analysis. Okay, so we've reached the point. Again, um, if you have any questions, uh, please um, please send your questions to questions at wglaw.com. And uh, Ken and I would like to thank you for attending uh, our webinar, which is Reinsurance 101. Uh, I do want to say we've only touched on a small portion of reinsurance. There's so much more out there. There's not only um, um, the reinsurance with respect to um, how treaties operate, but also uh, there's there's much more out there on reinsurance transactions, uh, how um, how um, reinsurance is purchased and uh, and um, and allocated in the marketplace. So if you want to want to learn more about this program and other Weber Gallagher events, you can do so at http dot slash slash www.wglaw.com slash wg dash university. I'm glad I got that final portion correct. <laughs> I think that was the hardest thing. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Have a good day.